Good afternoon. Welcome back from your lunch. I hope you are fine, not hungry anymore, not sleepy. I was told by someone, YouTube video, that I should wake you up by some entertainment. But, you know, I don't do magic tricks. I don't do jokes. I am so terrible at telling jokes. You probably heard them before. And <laughs> I know pretty, pretty odd jokes. Like, there was a catastrophic cyber incident. The government is still looking for the hacker. They think he ran somewhere. This kind of things. And of course, I don't, I don't memorize them properly, then it's a disaster, so. Well, anyway, put the jokes aside and let's begin with our third panel on quantum computing. We have this pleasure that so brilliant minds are here today and the moderator is Mr. Jan Bouda. Mr. Bouda, please, floor is yours. Okay, so hello and let me welcome you at the quantum computing panel. First, I would like to introduce the participants of this uh, panel. So we have here, uh, we have it alphabetically, which as a lucky coincidence is start with me. So my name is Jan Bouda and I'm uh, <coughs> the Sherpa of the Czech Republic in the European Quantum Communication Infrastructure Initiative. And I'm representing Czech Republic in the EU initiative and I'm coordinating the EuroQCI activities in Czech Republic. Otherwise, I'm affiliated to Faculty of Informatics, Masaryk University and Cybersecurity Hub, the Institute. Uh, I'm also coordinator of a related EU project, EDICT, which is about uh, device independent cryptography and we have some more participants here, like Professor Ulstein from the project. And also, I participated on the design and implementation of the first European quantum network in the two, year 2008 in Vienna. The name of the project was SecoQC. We have Professor Igor Yex here, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Nuclear Sciences and Physical Engineering of the Czech Technical University in Prague. He's also director of the, advanced, uh, of the Center of Advanced Applied Sciences. And you will hear uh, about some of his work today because he's author of uh, uh, Gaussian boson sampling design used in the recent quantum supremacy demonstration uh, performed in China. He also focuses on optical implementation of quantum information. We have here also Professor Rupert Ursin, who is uh, a senior group leader at the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And he is also a co-founder of a company, QT Labs, uh, that designs uh, devices or optical ground stations to do quantum communication with the satellites. He's expert on experimental quantum optics and he specializes in free space experiments and commercialization. And last but not least, we have uh, Associate Professor Mario Ziman, who is the director of the Institute of Physics of Slovak Academy of Sciences. He's also head of the Slovak national quantum platform Qt.sk. He's expert on mathematical mm -hmm. physics. He's also uh, collaborating and involved in the deployment of the Slovak European quantum communication infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this was uh, the, the introduction of the, of the members of the panel. And uh, since, since quantum computing and communication in general, it's, uh, it's a relatively new topic and very few people actually know what it is about and there are many, many false rumors spreading around. We decided that first I will give you some uh, not so long introductory presentation about what you can expect from the quantum computing and then we will actually follow up with the, with the panel itself. <coughs> so maybe, maybe the most important thing to understand the difference uh, or what is quantum information processing, I actually prefer this term to quantum computing, is that you have to understand that even in the classical computer the actual computation and information representation is physics. So you have to somehow uh, 
physically represent the information. It might be uh, a hole in a punch tape. It can be, you know, done via electricity. It can be done via photons, you know, in optical communication. So there is some physical representation. If you, if you do a calculation, then actually the calculation is physical process. And this is like very, very low at the bottom. Above this, you are, you are building up a tons of layers of abstraction. So the first abstraction is the, is the classical circuit. You know that you can place their AND, OR, XOR, and basically all these things together should be able to uh, implement any algorithm. Or even further, NAND should be sufficient. Then there is even a second abstraction, the micro, micro instructions of the processor. That's already like at least second abstraction. Then you have assembler, then you have the C language, and it's just piling up you know, the abstractions from the beginning. And what you have to understand about quantum computing is that we do not have these abstractions yet. You have the physical process, and you have the gate model, and that's basically all. And even the gate model is too high a level for the next 10 to 15 years to be used. So this is where we are. So the difference is that in the, in the classical computer, you have uh, something what is called bit, which mathematical model is 0 and 1, and you are trying to represent it using physics, and you have some computation done on that. I will come to that soon. And in the quantum computer, you have different physical systems, and they are representing uh, via a mathematical concept that is called qubit, or quantum bit. So in the classical computer, you have classical bit. The computation will be Boolean function, or a Boolean gate, and reading information is simple. In the quantum computer, you have quantum bit, which is not a value 0, 1, but basically it's a vector, if you simplify a vector from two-dimensional complex vector space. The computation is a unitary matrix, or you can see it as a unitary gate, so it's some kind of rotation of the, of the vector. And reading the information is not straightforward, let's leave it with that. The question is, of course, I mean, you, you can just uh, look at different physical system, you can make different mathematical model, but the question is, does it have actually any impact on the information processing? Because, you know, you can have a number of different models. You have the circuit model, you can have the C language, you can have the Turing machine. The question is, does it differ? Well, not so much in the classical case. But in this case, well, let's take a look at the answers. So does it make a difference for cryptography? Yes. Because we have the quantum key distribution, we have the quantum random number generators, we have device-independent technologies. We know that using uh, the quantum computer, you can break RSA, Diffie-Hellman, Elgamal. And because all of this, right now, we are discussing the post-quantum cryptography and trying to select and design new asymmetric algorithms to be used. Then, I'm mentioning the communication complexity for one simple reason. It's about uh, the communication complexity is about measuring the amount of communication you need to solve a distributed communication task. And for the communication complexity, we have a definite answer than yes. I mean, uh, the quantum communication can be asymptotically more efficient than classical. In some cases, in some cases not. Information theory, quite surprisingly, yes. So it means even if you have a proof that is done using information theory, security proof, it may turn out not to be secure in the quantum case. How about the quantum algorithms? Well, we have basically uh, like two, two traditional quantum algorithms, the Grover and the Shor type sh algorithms. What the Grover does, it's actually just a quadratic speed up. So it means uh, what it does actually have an unordered list and it can search or decide whether an element is present in the list, not in the linear time, but in a square root. What is it good for? Well, for instance, for cracking uh, symmetric ciphers. We'll come back to that later. In a, in a, in a known ciphertext setting, for instance. The short type algorithms, this is typically what kills the asymmetric algorithms. So in the most general version of this algorithm, it solves something what is called a hidden subgroup problem for abelian groups. It has exponential speed up in comparison to known classical algorithms. So just uh, you know, appreciate this maybe subtlety. It might be very well possible that RSA is not secure even against classical computers. We just do not know the algorithm to break it. In the quantum case, we actually know the algorithm. But it doesn't mean that you know, quantum uh, computers are better than classical for this task, it looks like. 
Also, there is quite a lot of applications in the area of machine learning, uh, finding approximate solutions for the hard problems, and some, uh, some more areas that I will mention soon. This is just you know, some, some short summary of, uh, of uh, how, how the quantum computer impacts security of uh, various crypto systems. So basically, you can you can uh, you can divide them into two groups: the asymmetric ones that are facing uh, the short uh, trap algorithm. They are no longer secure and have to be replaced. The algorithms that are attacked uh, by the Grover type algorithms, they just need larger key sizes or larger output. So the question is, what can you actually expect uh, from the from the quantum technologies in the area of uh, informatics? <clears throat> so we have uh, quantum random number generators. Just very, very briefly, you have to understand that there is not much randomness in the theory of classical physics. So all of the classical random number generators you have, there are usually something what is called a chaotic system. So it means that you do not have a complete knowledge of the state of the system at the beginning, and the small ignorance about the knowledge of the system then implies a large unpredictability about the outcome of the system. While if you make it just very short and very simplified, and if the qu current interpretation of the quantum physics is right, then quantum measurement is truly random. Of course, we have the quantum key distribution. In the classical case, you have to rely basically on uh, computationally secure solutions. So either on the solutions that already are broken, or on the solutions that are right now being proposed for the post-quantum cryptography. While in the quantum case, uh, there is something what is called unconditional security. That means uh, unconditional security in this context means that uh, the protocol is secure uh, if uh, our current understanding of the physics is correct. So in order to break the protocol, you have to disprove some part of the classic, of the current physics understanding. Uh, quite quite big area, you know, which are not part of the of the standard, <clears throat> uh, maybe informatics, but very big business for quantum computers is in simulating uh, other quantum uh, uh, quantum systems, and basically this has you know like a number of applications in the drug invention, in the car batteries, by the way also in agriculture fertilizers, which was quite 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 funny because. Uh, my, my colleague from Poland approached me that he was actually asked by a company producing uh, the fertilizers to collaborate with them and help them design better fertilizers, and he was offended by that. But if you think about this, I mean, this is a very viable application of this. Of course, chemical compounds in, in general. Let's make it a bit quicker. Okay. <clears throat> Let's give you a brief overview like of the, of the iron, of what you can lay your hand right now. So you can, of course, have already for many years the quantum random number generators. This is, this is the older version where you can see either the USB version or you can see the, the uh, PC card version. Nowadays, you can find them even in some of the cell phones produced in South Korea. Of course, you have the quantum key distribution devices. Here we have a pair of the devices uh, by Toshiba. And of course, you can have uh, you can have this is still more experimental area. You can have uh, quantum key distribution via free space. I'm sure Rupert will tell us much more about that because this is essentially his experiment. So for the last number of years, he has been going, you know, has been suffering, you know, at uh, the islands of uh, La Palma and Tenerife. Uh, Rupert, was it in winter or in summer? It's close to the equator. It doesn't matter. Ah, okay, good point. Yeah. <laughs> So it means he, he went there in the winter mainly. Yeah, so the, Rupert's message would be, you know, uh, go there in the winter. And it's ideal place if you want to do experiments during the long winters. So it was, these were experiments about the quantum key distribution in open, uh, in free space. Of course, one of the milestones was the SECO QC project that was finalized in the year 2008. And it was, I think, maybe the second quantum network in the world, uh, for sure the biggest at the time. It was the first assembled in the Europe. And uh, basically it was assembling, uh, about assembling a small quantum key distribution network around the Vienna metropolitan area. 
and the consortium had more than 40 partners, including at that time Austrian Institute of Technology, Siemens, Toshiba, Hewlett Packard, Thales, ID Quantic, and many more. So this is maybe just uh, the scheme of the network. And now we make a big leap in the time, and we are coming uh, to the year something like 2015, 16, 17. Because at the year 2008, Europe was essentially leader. We had a big one to network. We had the technology to make the satellites, but these technologies were not financed. And actually, the Chinese students who were studying in Vienna, they learned the technology. They got financed by China. And that's why China, uh, in the year 2017, opened a 2,000 kilometer long backbone of the quantum key distribution. And uh, it was connecting you know, along the coast, the capitals, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Hefei, and Yunnan. And also, uh, they, uh, they launched uh, a quantum satellite in the year 2016, Mishius. So it's a, a satellite that has some quantum payload and is able to do quantum key distribution between satellite and ground. And uh, I mean, at least uh, thanks to that, uh, Professor Ursin was able to develop some of his devices that he's, uh, he's, ready, he's preparing to sell in the next year or two. And these are the optical ground stations that are supposed to collaborate with the future ESA satellites. Uh, ESA is uh, planning to start launching the quantum satellites, I think, in the year 2023, 24, something like this, if I remember the plans correctly. And these ground stations will be able to communicate with the quantum satellites and do the quantum key distribution between distant, uh, distant places. So finally, the, the Europe started uh, to make a couple of answers and started to try to join the, the quantum chase. Uh, in 2006, uh, the Europe started designing and gradually launching something what is called quantum flagship. It's originally, uh, it originally was the plan to have one billion euro project with the goal to boost the European quantum industry. It's not only about the quantum key distribution, it's about quantum computers, quantum components, quantum technologies in general. And gradually, I mean, Europe and the national st some of the national states realized that if they want to chase up and if they want to commercialize on this new technology revolution, which has approximately the same financial potential as maybe introducing computers or even more. So if they want uh, to join this, they need uh, much more money. So right now, uh, maybe my colleagues will correct me, but I think in the whole Europe, the government investments are something like 10 uh, billion euros right now. And for instance, just the Germany and just from the recovery and resilience facilities after COVID money is giving two or three billion euros into these technologies to boost up their industry. Uh, to, to compare, I mean, the Poland, uh, Austria and Hungary have also huge program, programs to support these technologies. Czech Republic does not have yet, but we are hoping that uh, it may change. So we are like still like three, four years after Hungary and Poland in this. The EuroQCI, that's another initiative of the European Commission. And the idea is to find an answer or make, uh, create an answer to the Chinese uh, quantum key distribution network. And basically, uh, the idea is that Right now, starting 2022, the member states that are uh, participants of this initiative should start building their national quantum key networks. And uh, these will be joined into one big uh, European quantum network. And this version that is being planned and built uh, right now is supposed to be a testing network. So it's not supposed to serve any purpose like any real communication yet, but it's supposed to uh, I will just change the slide. On the Czech version, I will just tell you the, the goals. So to give you an example, uh, the current plans for the Czech EuroQCI that are just being prepared is that we expect something like 900 kilometers of uh, optical fiber connection, 15 to 20 QKD links, with the backbone connecting Prague, Brno, Ostrava, and then connecting uh, neighboring countries. So it means Austria, Germany, Poland, Slovakia. This is all under negotiations, these things. And there will be some metropolitan branches. What you have to understand is, uh, what is this network about? It's about key distribution. So quantum key distribution does only a single thing only. 
it manages to establish a bipartite symmetric cryptographic key. Once this is established, the quantum part is over. And then you can use this in the communication over the standard internet, for instance. Okay? So the whole thing uh, that is supposed to be performed by this network is to distribute uh, the symmetric cryptographic key. Especially because uh, of you know, many intrinsic limitations of this technology. The goal of this infrastructure, so even in the future, if and when the European Commission decides and starts the full deployment, the target is something what is called critical infrastructure. This is not to be understand in the strict uh, understanding as of the Czech law, because this will be, I mean, the particle institutions to be connected will be specified later. But this is, you know, really like you have to be thinking about uh, military applications, you know, secret services, you know, some important government institutions and things like this. And not all communication, but only selected communication of this. So, so the message that maybe you should take from this is that this quantum network and quantum communication infrastructure, it should be something that will be implementing extremely secure communication that is secured in part using the quantum cryptography. In part, it will be also secured using post-quantum cryptography. It will be combined together. And that's basically the goal. This is what I already mentioned. So here you can see uh, some pictures from the experiments of the ESA, the European Space Agency. And this is actually the, the telescope in La Palma that is receiving the green laser beacon from the ESA optical ground station at Tenerife. And it's a preparation of uh, the quantum teleportation experiment, correct? You, you seem a bit uneasy. Also, here you can see uh, a communication of the ESA optical ground station uh, in, in Graz. And here it's tracking the Chinese Mishu satellite. What you see is not a quantum communication. Yeah, actually, you don't see anything. Yeah, probably. OK, so if you, con you can see the green, green light. So that's basically the laser from the satellite. It's, it's, a, it's a line because it's, a, it's a like a long exposure photo. So that's why it's line. And the, the red thing that you almost can, cannot see, that's, uh, that's the signal from the, from the ground. How about, uh, how about some uh, quantum computers? So this, what you can actually see, is the quantum chip by IBM. As you can see, it's not too big, right? And this is what the computer looks like. And the question is, why, why, why is there such a big difference? And the answer is uh, cooling. So most of the stuff that you see is actually cooling. So IBM right now is making a big public statements. And with every quantum computer they, they create, they make it public. Uh, in mid-2020, they were announcing they had 18 quantum computers. Many of them you can access via uh, their web interface that is called uh, IBM Quantum Experience. And you can program it using the, uh, some Python library that is called Qiskit. The largest has 53 qubits, and they announced 1,000 qubit computer by 2023. Well, let's see. And as you see, of course, if you are investing so much money, it must look very cool. So this is like uh, the case that they designed for the 20 qubit system. This is just some list of companies. So actually, I would not say that IBM is making money on quantum computers now, of course not. But they are actually already getting money from the commercial companies for, for the time and collaboration on using their, uh, their computers. And the motivation of, of these companies is simply to have, have a start, you know, to have like an advantage and already have designed and tested algorithms and have them ready for the moment when the quantum computers become useful. So this is why these companies are already paying right now, you know, like millions of dollars to IBM to collaborate on the design of the quantum algorithms they need and also to use the run, uh, running time of their quantum computers. There has been much said about uh, the quantum supremacy. <clears throat> so basically, uh, just to give you an idea, like uh, a year ago or two years ago, Google announced something what they called quantum supremacy. And then, I mean, there was some public discussion, and in the end, it was unclear what happened. So, so basically, the question is, did they achieve the quantum supremacy or not? Well, 
I mean, for me, quantum supremacy is uh, mostly a PR thing. So I will let you to decide for yourself. So the quantum supremacy, it's some kind of point of time or event, and it's achieved when the quantum computer, for the first time, computes some task that would uh, take impractically long time, even if we join all classical computers of the world. So it means it's a moment where we actually compute something that we would not be able to compute without the quantum computer. Of course, I mean, right now, uh, what, what, you, what you will observe is that the computational task is designed specifically to be difficult on the classical computer and easy on the quantum computer. So it's, don't expect something useful to be done right now. So these are just very specific tasks, only to show that the quantum computer can do something what you cannot do classically, not a useful thing. And they, they are preparing the quantum computer specifically to prepare this task, you know, so it's not like full-scale general quantum computer that can do every, every algorithm as efficiently, you know, usually. But it depends on what kind of uh, supremacy task. So uh, th this computation that was, uh, uh, was performed by the Google Sycamore quantum computer, and the calculation took 3 minutes and 20 seconds. And uh, Google estimated uh, that all computational resources of Google would need 10,000 years to compute it. And actually, this is why, why, why this result was, I would say, such a PR blunder. Because they were right, actually. <laughs> and at the same time, they were wrong. So they were right that the Google resources would take 10,000 years. But meanwhile, you know, the thing is they designed the experiment like at one point of time, then it took something like uh, two or three years to prepare it, and they did not check how the classical computers improved meanwhile. So what happened meanwhile at IBM delivered a supercomputer summit that is deployed in the Oak Ridge US National Lab. And it seems that this supercomputer would be able to do this computation in two and a half days. So, I mean, it was a big, uh, big shame, right? Uh, because at one, the, uh, one hand side, they showed that uh, the Google computing resources were much inferior to IB, single IBM computer. And at the same time, it did not seem like they achieved quantum supremacy. But basically, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's just a minor thing because honestly, if they just knew this in advance and they set up the experiment differently, waited maybe half a year, they could have created a computer that would be, quantum computer would have two, th one, two, three qubits more, and then even, even the IBM computer will be dead. And we'll, you will be back in these 10,000 years numbers. So uh, it's just, you know, a coincidence. I would not draw too much thing from that. <clears throat> also, China started uh, investing heavily into, into uh, quantum supremacy. And you can see that Professor UX is already moving because one of these experiments was uh, designed based on his theoretical work. That's actually the first one. So uh, first announcement of achieving quantum supremacy in China was uh, at the end of uh, in December 2020. And uh, the computer performed a specific Boson sampling task. The quantum calculation was few minutes and the estimated supercomputer calculation would be 2 billion years and the technology was based on photon, this computation. In, in June, so it means like two, three months ago, uh, there was another announcement and the Chinese came with superconducting computer. There's a different technology how to implement the quantum computation. It's comparable to what Google and IBM do. They have this more or less comparable technology. And uh, it performed different kind of algorithm and the quantum calculation was 1.2 hours and the estimated supercomputer calculation would be eight years. Here you have just some overview of other quantum computers that is not so important. Maybe it might be interesting to mention what Amazon does because they actually, uh, they actually started to follow the same business model as they did with the web services. If you remember originally when they started web services, it was basically they started to buy you know, a, a third party a graphical cards or maybe some supercomputers and create a web, a web interface. And if you pay, they will give you access to some calculation time on these devices. And only much later and recently they started to produce some of their hardware. So in the quantum case, they basically are doing the same thing. So they are collaborating with a third party producers of quantum computers. They created a division of the Amazon Web Services. They created their own system to program the quantum computers. It's called Bracket. 
and now you can, you can access the quantum computers using the Amazon Web Services. And at the same time, they are heavily investing into quantum research. Right now, they, they founded, uh, founded the Quantum Research Institute of Amazon, which is adjacent, I think, to one of these California institutions. I think it's uh, actually adjacent to Caltech, but I'm not certain completely. I would have to check it for you. Okay, and maybe just a last uh, thing to comment. It's important to understand that if you look at the quantum computer, it's not just the number of qubits. Because you can, you can hear from some European startups, uh, some fantastic numbers, that they have 1,000 qubit or some qubits or something like this. So what you usually have to look at is what is the noise and what they can calculate with this. How many steps they, they can do of the calculation and with what, what fidelity. And for that, there is something what is called uh, the quantum volume. It's some kind of benchmarking proposed by IBM, and you can, you can Google it. OK, so that will be all for the introduction. So thank you for your attention. And I will move to the panel, panel part of the discussion. <clears throat> So let me first thank uh, my colleagues for patience. And first I will give you a provocative question. What is a qubit? And we have, you know, we have, we have a computer scientist, we have theoretical quantum optics, and we have experimental optics. So I guess everybody will give you a completely different answer. So I, I take the word here. Because I'm an Austrian, the obvious answer to this question is Schrödinger cat. So it's a cat which is at the same time dead and alive. And our Austrian friends have the permission to use uh, living animals for their experiments. Yep. This is uh, Schrödinger died in 1950. I, yeah, so something. Uh, still, you need a permission to do that now. <laughs> uh, actually, coming back to qubits and what uh, Honza said in his nice introduction is that. Uh, uh, you see, uh, after Google made the first experiment, uh, so to say the optical branch was considered dead uh, because uh, when we would look back, then the first steam engines essentially have been used to pump water out of mines. So the first really operational steam engines have been called the miners' friend because they got rid of this nasty water all over the mines, but uh, even though it's a steam engine, we must not forget that certain countries which are still in somehow in Europe made them big, just they've been able to manufacture the steam engines. So uh, we should not condemn the steam engines in such a way. And on the other hand, I uh, because the first ideas about using quantum uh, the other way around, meaning when you recall the Feynman papers where he pointed out at a certain level we do not have a well-defined zero and one because of the construction. So Feynman turned the question around and said, can we use this, this when I have a zero and one supported by uh, superposition, meaning the qubits, can I use it in, uh, in, in a favorable way? Uh, these are the 80s of the last century, and after 30 years, 30, 40 years, we have really commercial applications, even though uh, you say primitive. If you compare that with another revolution, that was the nuclear, which our friends in Austria do not like that much, or is it better now in Austria, nuclear? <laughs> can we use the nuclear in the presence of an Austrian? Yes. Well, most probably we can. So when you think there that the idea of, of, a, of a chain reaction is 33 and 45, you'll, you, you, you had the first, sorry to call that practical application of the chain reaction, then uh, you have about 15 years we are 30, but uh, talk about a much larger market. Uh, so I think uh, it's certainly worth to have a link and get 
if you are a big company, to get accustomed to this quantum domain in communication. And uh, um, Rupert can uh, correct me, uh, but uh, the first, the the next five to ten years, I think we will see an explosion in the applications of quantum. Is that so? And not only in Austria. Uh, yeah. All right. So, I mean, basically, I mean, as, as you got it, uh, you, you can have two answers to this. And uh, probably the most useful one is that it's still highly advanced technology. So it's more for testing and becoming familiar with this technology. And maybe the main obstacle f to actually practically introducing it is that there is no certification of these devices. So you like, do not know to how high standards the producer of this device is adhering and what you are actually buying. And there has been recent uh, problem with ID quantic devices, for instance. So I would say, before you consider it using uh, for any real purpose, wait for the certification, wait for the training of the personnel, because actually that's one of the main, if not the main goal of the EuroQCI in Czech Republic, is to train the personnel from the area of uh, classical network security to work with the quantum technologies, to train the personnel from the area of the optical fiber, classical optical fiber and classical optics technology, to train them in the area of uh, quantum technologies, just to prepare the personnel and people able to use the technologies, you know, if and when it's fully deployed. But I mean, if you, despite all of that, what's said, want to play with the technology and test it, then I mean, we are very happy and we are happy that people are interested in that, and it's very easy. I mean, just you can order it from ID Quantic, from Toshiba. They will give you a proper training how to use the software. They will even plug it for you into the optical fiber if you ask them. They can do planning for you, whatever you want. So you can already order it, uh, what's the English word? Is it on the key? Na klíč. So you can just basically have your solution made ready if you want to test it. Okay, now we have a bit of time remaining and I maybe will ask a dangerous question and maybe I will have to stop, uh, stop uh, maybe flame war if it starts. So we are observing a technological revolution that has a huge commercial potential. So, and from this observation of this technological revolution, what did you learn? What should be the ideal synergy of the basic research, applied research, government funding, company funding, what kind of funding is it necessary? If so, if a country wants to commercialize and get a full economical benefit of such a revolution, what should they do? As usual, invest into people, I think, and uh, train the people, at least for the Czech Republic. Uh, uh, we shot, uh, uh, that's the one thing. The other thing, uh, form a reasonable frame. We repeatedly heard how, men, how much money, these are tremendous sums which have been invested in the West. Uh, also Austria, Poland invested, there wasn't any dedicated program in the Czech Republic concerning quantum. So, and uh, most of, uh, and Rupert knows uh, much better, uh, that um, this is not only the error of the same, uh, it's not, our government does not make errors, so it, they just overlooked certain developments, uh, technological, uh, to be, I, I, I'm correcting myself, yeah, it's, no errors. Um, but uh, uh, say in Austria, they've been uh, repeated proposals, say, for a quantum satellite. The idea was born there, and because uh, no one in, uh, most probably Austria was too small, Europe was not interested, the idea was transferred to China and taken over. Similarly, a lot of the competencies which have been developed in the, uh, within uh, the European universities have been taken over uh, either in China, because the students have been trained here, meaning in Europe, or uh, they went to US. So the activity is there. So the idea is make a sufficient environment which is stimulating for the basic research, for applied research, and they will find it. It will be 
it will always be uh, medium size costly, but uh, otherwise we would not be in the situation uh, like we are now and what we are discussing also on the EU level. And very similarly, it's with uh, other highly developed uh, technologies. Our Austrian friends will not listen, but say also nuclear or thermonuclear technologies. There the, the story just simply repeats. The leaders in nuclear technology are already in China and India based on ideas which have been developed in Europe. So hopefully with quantum the situation does not repeat. Maybe I can just follow because uh, I was observing this, you know, during the the design of the quantum flagship project. Uh, there have been many comparisons between the US, China, Europe, Canada, uh, and these regions. So basically it seems the, the, the functional model, uh, and to super functional model, you have to have a steady support for the basic research. And actually as soon as it approaches, the closer it approaches the TRL3, so it means creating the proof of the concept. So this is the amount you have to intensify, intensify the money into the area. And as soon as it reaches the TR3, you have to simply switch uh, to applied research funding and highly commercial funding. But this is, you know, not a problem just of the government. So like, for instance, Europe in general was uh, quite nicely funding the quantum technologies around the year 2000. And when it was approaching the actual commercial implementation, they, they started to cut down the fundings. Austria was funding, uh, maybe Rupert will disagree, but the basic research was funded well, right, in Austria. But at the same time, I mean, as soon as the basic research started to bring some fruits that were possible to commercialize, there was not a will to pay the money to transfer. And the Chinese took the technology. You can also compare, for instance, IBM and Siemens. So Siemens, as I mentioned in 2008, they had a very nice uh, team for the quantum key distribution. And it was participating and already making some devices. And it's just that I think, do not know when, but maybe 2010, 2012, somehow Siemens decided to sell the whole team that its technology was not promising. At the same time, IBM was paying uh, some small research quantum team, and I think they started paying them maybe already in 1990. Because for them it's no money. They paid a couple of people, like the Charles Bennett from the BB84, the first quantum protocol. And they just let them do any research and did not expect any actual results from that right now. They just knew that if it happens maybe once that this technology is commercial. We already have a couple of experts. These are the, the best experts in the world. But it doesn't cost us much. We are a huge company. We have a lot of money. So this is our small investment maybe into big future. And at the moment, you know, at, uh, at one point, I actually know it from Charles Bennett. So I can tell you the story very exactly. So the CEO or maybe president of IBM was just sitting in the chair reading a newspaper. And he read about a Canadian startup called D-Wave and that they claim to have something like quantum computer. And I was thinking, huh, quantum, that somehow rings a bell. Don't we have some quantum people? So we asked, you know, his subordinates, they asked their subordinates, they started to search the basements. And finally, somewhere at TJ Watson Research Center in New York, they found Charles. So they took Charles to the president and asked him, uh, shall we do that as, as well? And Charles told him, well, the DVA is not an actual quantum device like full scale, but we should do it our way, and yes, we should do it right now is the moment. And what they did, they actually built up on the excellent basic research that was at the American universities. They were able to go to these universities to buy the students that were produced, sometimes to buy the whole teams. So they had the seed, the small investment for a long time. And then at the right moment, they used a huge amount of money to buy the, the teams from the universities at the same time, and then they went like a steamroller. If you compare it to Siemens, uh, when the quantum flagship started, something like 2016, they also somehow vaguely recalled that they had some quantum people. They started to search for them, and then they realized they already sold them. So they had nothing. So they have less money uh, to invest, less, uh, less will to invest, and they did not keep the people for sufficiently long time and sufficiently high quality people. So that's maybe to, the lesson to be learned from this, you know, that you really, if you want to participate on the next technological revolution that may happen maybe 20 years again, then you must be ready. You must keep an eye on the technology and on the basic research and be ready to grab the opportunity and turn it into a commercial. 
So I see you want to tell something. No, no, no just a comment. The Siemens also sold their nuclear section, so. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Well, so maybe so much for that. And maybe we can leave a bit of time for the questions from the audience. So I will check what we have. Uh -huh. So the first question, what are the actual impacts of quantum computing breaking cryptography as we know it today? And are the companies or, and or countries preparing for it as far as you know? Well, I mean, uh, if you look at the recommendation of the NIST, then I think already in year 2015 they published... Uh, sorry that I started answering. Somebody wants? No. No, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry about this. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm forgetting. So, so, so basically, already in 2015, they published a recommendation that everybody using the algorithms that are broken uh, by the quantum algorithms should be stopped being used. At, at, at the moment, as soon as possible. Because you have to understand, I mean, maybe for the next 15 years these algorithms won't be implemented. But you know that all of the communication that is done now is being stored. You know it thanks to Snowden. And of course, I mean, uh, all of, many of these messages, they still will have a value 15 years from now. So even if the algorithm is broken, all the messages backwards are broken, that you have to understand that's the problem. And if you look at the progress, <coughs> then, well, there was not much progress. Meaning, the NIST started uh, selecting uh, uh, what algorithms will, from the post-quantum cryptography, it means algorithms that are currently not known to be broken by quantum computers. So which algorithms should be recommended for the use? And if I remember correctly, uh, in January 2019, they finished and announced the results of the second round of the selection in summer 2020, they announced they are starting the third selection round, and the results not yet done. So we have six years from when NIST said it should be done as soon as possible, and we still do not have even the candidates, not speaking about the actual replacement at the level of the software. And maybe, <clears throat> sorry for the colleagues, because there was one thing uh, I did not include in the presentation. So maybe the question is whether you should deploy the quantum key distribution or not. I, I'm not going to tell you yes or no. I will just uh, tell you how to think about it and how to decide. Because what you have to think about it, it's not the answer whether the algorithm will be broken or not. Because, I mean, you will say it won't be broken with high probability. But it's the same thing as uh, having a tornado in Moravia. So if there is an insurance company and you ask uh, the, the guy who calculates the insurance, about the tornado in Moravia, and he says, no way, we will just put it there for free, this doesn't happen, it just looks good. But the problem of the tornado is it not only happens very unlikely, but it also brings huge costs. And this is the same thing as breaking the post-quantum cryptography algorithms. So if such an algorithm is broken in the future, just imagine you will be without internet. I mean, that's, I would say, I would call it apocalyptic idea. And my personal impression sometimes is that uh, the, uh, the standards of the security they were designed for the internet of 1995 or 2000. What would happen if you break asymmetric cryptography in 1995, six? Well, not much. In 2000, I would just turn off the computer, turn on the lab and read some nice book. If you do it right now, I'm not sure I will be able to turn on the lamp. I certainly would not watch on Netflix. I think not even the normal cable TV would be working. So, I mean, it's really an apocalyptic idea. So, what you have to take a look is to, you have to take the probability of this very unlikely event. It's like it's called a black swan, like in the case of the, of the crisis of 2008. And also, <clears throat> multiply it by the possible damages, which will be extreme. And then you have to compare it. You have to look at the QKD, which of course you should not be deploying to every kind of connection. That's not used for that. It's not usable for that. It cannot replace asymmetric cryptography. It's for symmetric cryptography only. But you can use it as a kind of you know, security, uh, security backup. And if you do this, then take a look what is the chance of breaking the quantum cryptography, the QKD, 
and at the same time the post-quantum cryptography because the usage will be in synergy of both of these things in the quantum communication infrastructures and then compare it with the costs of deploying the quantum key distribution. So basically what I'm telling you, you should do the full calculation like if you would be doing a risk analysis you know, in an insurance company or something like this. And I can't tell you yes or no because I'm not able to get you these numbers. But I'm just telling you this is the way you should be thinking about this. Okay, so maybe colleagues can just join. Sorry about this. So the question is, uh, what will be like the, the impacts and likeliness of, uh, of uh, what will be the impacts of quantum computing on the security and cryptography? Yeah, on the other hand, what we did not emphasize is that uh, uh, the sheer possibility that you have quantum information uh, forces people, these extremely smart but slightly paranoid cryptographs, cryptography fans, to think about their field in a different way. So that's also one immediate impact. They, they, they know that certain things could be done in principle, so they are forced to uh, reevaluate. And, in, and come up with uh, new ideas, even though when some of the new ideas are based on, a, on the same like they used to have simply faith that certain uh, mathematical procedures cannot be broken. Similarly, like uh, uh, it was al already mentioned, it's not proven uh, that classically you cannot factorize large products. Simply we don't know. And we still, there are hints that it really cannot be broken by classical means and brute force. But someone extremely smart can come up with an idea and then the whole thing goes down the drain. I, if I can comment about this, how quantum computing affects the cryptography. Of course, I mean, one of the motivation to develop, it was not originally the, the case, but one of the motivation to develop this quantum cryptography might be the, 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 uh, uh, the discovery of the Shor algorithm that basically breaks the currently used or most common cryptographic system. But, uh, but also, uh, kind of, we are also now using, uh, some, some of us probably are using these bitcoins or whatever. And uh, this is also based on, this is some, there is some security based on some algorithms and also quantum computing is currently already affecting some of them. Yeah, and uh, they're also creating new ones that are post-quantum in this sense. Yeah. And, uh, and I hope and, uh, that uh, we are not, not yet in the, in the age that basically we will use quantum uh, uh, kind of quantum computation to basically secure this, let's say, let's say this something like the bitcoins, yeah? But, it, but there is definitely a possibility that we can use quantum computers also to do this thing, yeah? And then whether this will be breakable by quantum computers again or can be done, I mean, this is a theory that is not yet developed even, yeah? So this is a... There are, there are many things we can think about in this uh, kind of in the, in the world of existing quantum computers, and we are not yet thinking about yeah? So, okay. so we have a next question, and let's see. I mean, I have in mind a single word answer to this question. So let's see whether my colleagues will find the same. So, what is the main weakness of the quantum computing? Main weakness. Main weakness of the quantum computing. You don't have to limit to one word, I'm just such Tech technology. <laughs> no, okay. Sorry, what technology? I don't know. If it is one word, then if it's one word, then I would say that now we are waiting for the technology to be developed. So well, yeah. I would say but no, it's not a weakness of, of computing as well, it's only a weakness of the implementation or realization of this idea. Okay. Yeah, so my answer would be noise. <laughs> That's the Somebody, wants to... Somebody else wants to join? Or we, c we can just look at the next. Yeah, I, I would, not, would say, because we are the, the advocates of quantum technology, so it does not have a weakness. And <laughs> when there is a potential weakness, I'm certain it will be turned in favor of quantum computing. Because say, say also one thing which was completely not missed, but uh, extremely vaguely uh, mentioned is that there are three main directions in quantum technology. One is communication, the other is computing, and the, the third one 
is metrology, where quantum effects will be used to, so to say, make more precise or faster clocks, which again will help uh, the whole uh, whole area of communication. So uh, uh, the weakness of quantum computing just appears when someone really wants to buy a quantum computer to uh, play his Netflix ray TV, then for that quantum communication and computation and so on is not useful, but uh, um, we, it opens so many possibilities uh, that even though I'm, I'm personally convinced that even though weaknesses finally can be used as, a, as an interesting, at least an interesting way how to look back on quantum uh, computing and turn it into its favor, like uh, just remember he was the example of the steam engine. Uh, when, the, uh, when the steam engine revolution was in a full run, then essentially all of them just saw the advantages. And then came the greens. Maybe I thought about one more word, there's a problem, and I would say it's heat. So Robert, can you tell us about how much you have to cool? How much what? How much uh, you have to cool, do the cooling at your experiments, so what temperatures you are aiming for? No, I'm not a quantum computing expert. Um, but you are doing experiments, you know, like for the device independent, and actually have to go for temperatures much lower than the computers. So. So you, you know too much about my research, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, you should not let me into your yeah, labs, that's okay. the problem. So the, we, we use, a, but this is a totally different, different field, so in my uh, research career we are doing those kind of experiments in a very similar technology as the quantum computers do. We have to reach to detect single photons with a probability one. We have to reach some millikelvin of, of, of temperature just to keep um, this little tungsten uh, device as, as coo cool as possible and we measure actually the temperature change of a single photon which uh, comes to this tungsten um, 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 device. Um, th this is one of the future technologies which might be on the market in a couple of years. Today we use on the commercial viable market we use totally different systems. This is a Peltier cooled um, INGAS uh, detector very similar to what is used in classical telecommunications. Instead of doing it in the, in the proportional mode, I understood this is a technical um, audience, so I can talk in talk technical terms here. It's a it's a Geiger mode uh, based uh, either silicium or INGAS uh, device. So this is the, the kind of detection systems we are using. The the sources we use either attenuated laser in a very special way, attenuated laser and we, we, we randomly switch polarization so we use the polarization degree of freedom you can use all degree of freedoms of the photon to, to do quantum communication um, in some other um, implementations um, we use modulators we use um, uh, lasers uh, crystals to do nonlinear effects in crystals actually the time reverse of, of, of um, uh, 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 frequency doubling, we, we have the, the frequency, we do down conversion, not up conversion, we do down conversion um, to do these, these um, um, Köding, Schrödinger cat-like states. So this, just to give a little overview of the, of the technologies which are um, used on the market today. Maybe one thing to expand still, Maybe it might be interesting for the audience. So how do you actually do the cooling to a millikelvin? It's not normally conditioning, right? It's not a, just a small fan also. That would not do the trick, right? Uh, uh, yeah, good point. Maybe you never, don't have to never, answer if you don't, don't Never ask to. a scientist without giving him a constraint on the time. Uh, okay, I, so I the, very, the very short answer is it's a Peltier cooled and the, the, the ingas detectors and the, and the silicium detectors, they work at minus 20, minus 30 degrees, depends how much noise you can endure with your quantum protocol. So this is where the, the technical de details really start from. Um, 
in, in how, what, what the distance is and so on and so forth, so how much uh, noise you can endure, how good your uh, um, error correction and privacy amplification procedure is, and so on and so forth. So um, in most of the implementations, you can uh, use Peltier cooling, which is minus 20, minus uh, 30 degree. But if you if you go to millikelvin, we use an entirely different order form, I would say. So this is a, not a Peltier cooling, uh, this is an adiabatic uh, demagnetization refrigerator, and um, we can discuss that, I think, uh, at the coffee, if you're interested. Yeah, but millikelvin are standard in the lab. This is by far not the lowest temperatures you yes, can sure. get. No, so no. it's standard, pro, standard technology. So and and uh, this is the detector part. Otherwise, when you use photons, you do not need to cool. Yes. Yeah. I'm maybe, maybe the PDCs you have to warm up slightly, but uh, that's uh, it would not destroy our chess or whomever by feeding that or with electricity. That's uh, not a problem. And maybe a last question. So can you imagine a future where everybody will have at his home a quantum computer and possibly maybe a QQD in his own cell phone? I think that's enough. I mean, an answer. I mean, it's kind of a, a, sorry if I may say so, but it's a kind of a stupid question. I mean, in, in the 80s, people said there is no world market for personal computers, and uh, the world market is like five, yeah. if but I remember correctly. It's been the six, 60s, I think. It was, so, so the future is very, very, very uncertain. We don't know. And uh, one last message. We, we talked a lot about the existence of a quantum computer. And this is not the full story of quantum encryption and quantum key distribution. We have customers, I'm not allowed to, to say too much because the drawback of my business is the customers don't want to uh, let me speak publicly about their weaknesses. But um, uh, asymmetric key protocols, RSA, SSL, although what we are using for banking and so on, is very, very cheap. It's a piece of software and a part of the, of the hardware of the, of the CPU. Um, quantum key distribution is, is doing symmetric, not asymmetric. It's using a symmetric uh, uh, protocol. And the symmetric protocol is one of the oldest. The, the Romans even used it. Um, where they um, uh, de delivered a, a, a courier, you know, a trusted courier who just delivered the key, who, who, whom you give your, your, your message and the, the courier goes to, to, to the other authenticated partner. And these couriers, they still exist today. So we have customers that have software-defined networks with a couple of thousand subnets around the globe. They have to exchange these keys every week. And this is quite demanding in the, the pandemic. To, 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 there are traveling people with a USB stick and they have to trust in the whole business case. Yeah, they are the only <laughs> at some point, they were maybe the only traveling. At the whole business case depends on those people with this little USB case. And they are desperately looking for new symmetric solutions. And key distribution is a cheaper way it's a cheaper way to, to accomplish the same task. It has nothing to do with quantum, crypto, with quantum computers. It has nothing to do with the quantum age. It just delivers symmetric key without the expensive people traveling uh, uh, at, on, on a daily basis around the globe to the many thousand uh, um, uh, um, and software-defined networks, points of presence. I'm going to do too much detail, but, but the message is, it's surprisingly, quantum key distribution is sometimes easier, sometimes cheaper. But in many other use cases, it's, it's more, more expensive. But um, we should not focus too much on the, on the existence of, of, of the quantum computer here. It's, it's always a cost argument and a threat argument and how big the disaster would be if, if broken. Yeah, I would like just to remind, I, I, finally, I don't think uh, that uh, in each home there will be a quantum computer and there will be a, a cryptographic uh, interface uh, using uh, this quantum technology simply because it will not be needed. 
On the other hand, uh, with uh, this stage, with this under our understanding and use of quantum, uh, we opened another road where I think there will be uh, a lot of benefit uh, technologically. And uh, as an example, if and I'm certain there are many sci-fi fans here, just if you look into or remind yourself what was written in the older sci-fi, say, Star Trek. And there was the communication of the individuals by a simple handy device, which was considered in the late 60s, you know, something which will come in the 23rd century. And just when you look critically, their device was audio only, and there have been just three color buttons on it. 40 years after that, everyone has such a device which shows our uh, degree of control, if you want to say in, in a very broad words, our control of matter. So I think when we go down the quantum road, uh, we will have certainly much more efficient also classical devices because this, uh, every, or this, the whole technology We'll have a number of spin-offs. Um, essentially, we just dream. I like that argument. I will steal it for the future discussions. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I can only say one, one more thing to add, uh, one positive thing. So I, 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 so I don't know. I don't think that we currently see that what will be the use of these devices in, in everyone's home. Yeah. Uh, and currently the idea is that we will use cloud computers, so it's the same story as happened uh, in the past. But I think it very much depends on how much we will learn how to make fun of with these quantum devices, so how we will be able to develop something like quantum games or something like that. So there are some of them already uh, existing. So And, and if, this is going, if this is going to happen, then I'm sure that we, every one of us would be interested, or, or not every one of us, but child of every one of us would be interested to have uh, something like that at home and play with it at home. Yeah. So. so to follow up on this, you already can have quantum games nowadays, but I have to say it's just a board game. So there is a board game called Entanglion, and it was designed by the IBM Research. So if you want quantum game, you can have it now already. So, so let me let me thank you, the audience, for the attention. Let me thank all of the speakers of this panel, and I would say we will stay a bit longer. So, if you want to have some more questions, we will be just walking around maybe for a couple more minutes, so you can ask us in the foyer. So, thank you. Thank you very much for this brilliant panel and for the great discussion. I personally learned so many new things about quantum and also different perspectives regarding quantum computing. Uh, now let's proceed with our another lunch, oh sorry, coffee break. We are not in the, we are not in the shire, so we only have another coffee break. And let's meet again at 3.15. Thank you very much. <laughs>